When we perform experiments, an important concept regarding the measurements we obtain is the accuracy of the data. Accuracy is a measure of how close the experimental results are to the true value. But what exactly does this mean? Let's consider this through the example of Robin Hood at an archery competition. Robin Hood and his competitor, Awful Aim Adam, each have three arrows to fire at their targets. Naturally, Robin Hood hits the bullseye with each of his three shots, while his competitor's arrows hit the target all over the place. So who is more accurate? It's quite clear that Robin Hood is the more accurate archer, as all his arrows hit the bullseye. This works the same way as accuracy in science. The bullseye represents the true value of what we are trying to measure. The arrows are the experimental data we obtained. If our experimental method is accurate, like Robin Hood, then our results will be, in general, close to the true value. On the contrary, if we are inaccurate, like Awful Aim Adam, then our experimental values will be, overall, far away from the true value. Usually, we perform each step of our experimental method exactly as it's written down. Even so, our data can still be inaccurate. Why is that the case? This may be due to systematic errors. A systematic error is a repeated, reproducible error that is consistently in the same direction. To help understand what this means, let's go back to Robin Hood at the archery competition. This time, a strong crosswind is blowing to the left. Robin Hood still aims for the bullseye, but the wind blows each of his arrows to the left, so he always hits slightly left of the bullseye. This is a systematic error. Each time, the arrows are pushed in the same direction and are similar distances away from the true value. This systematic error has also made our data inaccurate, as our results have been pushed away from the true value, just like how the arrows have been blown away from the bullseye. But what gives us systematic errors in our experiments? Systematic errors are almost always a result of problems with how we have measured the value. That is, there is a problem with the instrument we are using to take the measurement, or there is a problem with the way in which we are using the instrument. For example, imagine you are weighing everyone in your class. However, when nothing is on the scale, it already has a reading of 2 kilograms. What will happen? Your results will show that everyone is 2 kilograms heavier than the true value of their weight. This systematic error exists because there is a problem with the instrument. The scales aren't starting at 0 kilograms, so of course they aren't going to read the correct weight. As a result, there is a repeated error that causes everyone to appear heavier. If we reset the scales so that they start at 0, we can remove this systematic error and everyone will get the correct weight again. Now, imagine we are performing an experiment to measure how long it takes for 50 millilitres of water to boil. However, when we pour and measure 50 millilitres of water, we look from above the meniscus. This is incorrect. Instead, we should measure the volume of water by looking from eye level. If so, we would realise that we only have 48 millilitres of water. Because of parallax error, we measure out slightly less water, so our water will boil faster. In this case, our result is less accurate because it is lower than the true value, as we have used the instrument incorrectly. This is just like one of Robin Hood's competitors, Too Tall Trevor. Too Tall Trevor is simply too tall and he makes the mistake of forgetting to adjust for his height when firing his arrow. So unfortunately, all of his arrows land above the bullseye. Just like when we don't look at our meniscus correctly, too tall Trevor's height is introducing a systematic error to his arrows, leading to a repeated, reproducible error 
in a single direction. Let's quickly revise what we've learned so far. Accuracy is a measure of how close the experimental results are to the true value. Accuracy can be reduced by systematic errors, where there is a repeated, reproducible error that is consistently in the same direction. Systematic errors occur when there is a problem with the measuring instrument or if we are using the instrument incorrectly. Let's go back to Too Tall Trevor, because Robin Hood is giving him some tips. What's this? Because Too Tall Trevor was landing all his arrows above the target, he could try to aim a little lower to reduce his systematic error and thus improve his accuracy. Genius! Similarly, there are ways that we can improve our accuracy when we perform experiments. Remember our first example? where the weight of everyone in the class was too high because the scales started at 2 kilograms? When we readjusted the scales to start at zero, we removed our systematic error. This is known as calibration, which is a process where we readjust our measuring instruments against standards or accurate known values to ensure that they are measuring results accurately. When conducting experiments for the HSC biology course, you may need to know how to calibrate a pH meter, which is used to measure the pH of solutions. If you recall from Year 10 Science, the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14. Acids, such as lemon juice, have pH values less than 7. Bases, such as bicarb soda, have pH values greater than 7. Pure water is neutral and has a pH of 7. What will happen if we use an uncalibrated pH meter to take measurements? Well, it might tell us that the pH of distilled water is 6.7 rather than the correct value of 7.0. Therefore, calibration is essential to obtain accurate pH measurements. To calibrate a pH meter, we should clean the electrode by rinsing it with deionized water and blotting it dry using a tissue. Then, the electrode is placed in a buffer solution of pH 7. This solution is neutral, so it is neither acidic nor basic. Next, we allow the pH reading to stabilize before we set the pH meter to read exactly 7. This process is usually repeated with a second buffer solution. For example, we could also use an acidic buffer solution with a pH of 4. After we perform the second calibration, the pH meter will correctly measure pH values ranging from 4 to 7. The pH meter is now calibrated and ready for use. Aside from the pH meter, there are plenty of other instruments that require calibration including mass balances and digital thermometers. Another way to reduce systematic error is to ensure that we are using and reading our instrument correctly. For example, if you are measuring the temperature of a solution and you stick the thermometer into the beaker upside down, there's absolutely no way your result will be accurate since it's measuring the wrong thing. Another example is parallax error, which we mentioned before. This occurs when we read the wrong value because we are not looking from the correct angle. For the measurement to be accurate, we must always read the instrument from eye level. One final method to reduce systematic error is to reduce the amount of interactions between our experiment and the environment. This is particularly important in experiments where temperature is a key factor. For example, you might perform an experiment where the aim is to determine the effect of temperature on the activity of catalase. Catalase is an enzyme, so it speeds up chemical reactions. In this case, catalase breaks down hydrogen peroxide to form water and oxygen. We can test the aim of this experiment by performing the same reaction with the same enzyme at different temperatures. 
we could have several test tubes containing 10 millilitres of hydrogen peroxide cooled or heated to varying temperatures from 10 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. Then we could place one gram of catalase enzyme into each test tube. We can measure the height of bubbles formed to determine the effective temperature on the activity of the catalase enzyme. However, hot objects will lose heat to the environment and cool down. On the other hand, cold objects will gain heat from the environment and warm up. Therefore, the temperature of the catalase enzyme mixture in each test tube will change. For example, the mixture in the test tube heated to 40 degrees Celsius will gradually cool down to ambient temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, the mixture in the test tube cooled to 10 degrees Celsius will eventually warm up to 25 degrees Celsius. Consequently, our experiment will occur at different temperatures than what we originally planned. This may affect the activity of the catalase enzyme in each test tube and reduce the accuracy of our results. To avoid this problem, we can modify the apparatus to avoid heat loss or gain. For example, instead of leaving the test tubes in the open, where they can easily exchange heat with the surrounding air, we can place them in a laboratory water bath. This will ensure that the test tubes are maintained at a consistent temperature, allowing us to obtain accurate results. Accuracy can also be affected by the resolution of instruments, which refers to how well the instrument can distinguish between two similar values. For example, let's look at this glass of orange juice. Using this beaker, which has increments of 50 millilitres, we can say the volume of orange juice is about 70 millilitres. However, we can't be certain about the value since it lies somewhere between the 50 and 100 millilitre mark. There is no way that we can be certain that the volume is exactly 70 millilitres as opposed to 73 or 67 millilitres. But if we use a measuring cylinder, which has increments of 1 millilitre, we can see that the volume is 68 millilitres. Our measurement is now more accurate, as the measuring cylinder can give us a number that is closer to the true value. If we want to be even more accurate, we can use a pipette, which is usually accurate to a fraction of 1 millilitre. Let's pause for a moment to look at the types of questions you could be asked in exams. Usually, you will be asked about accuracy in the context of a practical investigation. Questions will ask things such as, are the results accurate? Why are the results accurate or inaccurate? And how can we improve the accuracy of the results? The answers to each question will vary depending on which experiment you are asked about. If you would like to see how to answer these questions, please watch our videos for each of the practical investigations in the HSC course. Let's revise our understanding of this topic by looking at a sample question. Donna is using a microscope to estimate the size of blood cells. She observes two types of cells on the sample slide and estimates that one type is 50% larger than the other. Which of the following could be used to assess the accuracy of her findings? Pause the video to think about your answer. In general, a good approach to multiple choice questions is to check each of the available options and pick the best answer using the process of elimination. Starting with option A, the size of other cells in the body, will not help us to determine the size of the blood cells that we're observing. This is because cells in our body differ in their size and shape, depending on their role and where they are found. For example, nerve cells are long, skinny, and can grow to over one metre, while red blood cells are tiny discs that are thinner in the centre and have a diameter of approximately eight micrometres. That's the same as eight millionths of a metre which is really small. 
Therefore, option A is incorrect. Option B involves comparing Donna's results with those of other students. This is important to ensure that her results are relatively consistent with the findings of other students. However, this is an element of reliability rather than accuracy. Remember, accuracy is about how the equipment is used and how the experiment is performed. On the other hand, reliability refers to repeating experiments and obtaining similar results each time. We'll discuss this in our upcoming videos on reliability. In this way, the experiments of other students can be thought of as repetitions of Donna's experiment. As we can see, option B is also incorrect. Option C suggests that Donna should compare her results to the theoretical sizes of blood cells mentioned in scientific literature. This is a type of secondary source that is reviewed by several experts before it is published. Scientific literature is generally very accurate and reputable, so any results shown can be considered as the true value. You can think of scientific literature as a stack of high-quality textbooks that university professors refer to. Therefore, it looks like option C is the correct answer. However, let's check option D before making a decision. Option D describes repeating the experiment and taking an average. This is definitely an important thing to do, but it has no effect on the accuracy of the data. Remember, accuracy depends on how close the experimental results are to the true value, while reliability refers to performing repetitions of the same experiment. So, taking an average improves the reliability of the data. Thus, option D is incorrect. This means that our earlier reasoning was right. After estimating the sizes of blood cells using a microscope, Donna should assess her accuracy by comparing her findings to the expected values quoted in scientific literature. Hence, option C is the correct answer. Let's revise what we've discussed in this video. Accuracy is a measure of how close the experimental results are to the true value. Accuracy can be reduced by systematic errors. Accuracy is also limited by the resolution of instruments, which depends on the increments of your measuring device. Systematic errors are repeated, reproducible errors that are consistently in the same direction. We can reduce systematic errors by ensuring that we calibrate our measuring instruments, use the instruments correctly, and minimize any interactions with the environment. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on biology, check out our first video on reliability.